Good afternoon, everyone. This is Bassam Haddad, and I am very delighted to be joined today by Professor Joseph Sassoon. It is a very interesting conversation that we have every once in a while, which is an intellectual journey. And in this case, it's on knowledge production in Iraq, much of which uh, has to do with uh, the production of uh, Professor Sassoon, who is joining us today. Uh, good afternoon, Joseph Kifak. Good afternoon. Alhamdulillah. How are you? Very good. Very happy that you are joining us. I know that it is not fair to do this within the time span of uh, 40 minutes or an hour, but we will try our best. Uh, Joseph, before I uh, uh, proceed, if you uh, allow me to share uh, just a part of your uh, background via your bio, and I know it's not sufficient, but uh, let me just start. Uh, in addition to the bio, uh, I must say that I have known Joseph for maybe two decades, uh, and I've also led him for uh, perhaps a, a little longer than that, and I'm very um, honored to be joined by him. Uh, Joseph Sassoon is the director of the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies at Georgetown University and professor of history and political polit economy, uh, and he holds uh, the Al Sabah Chair in political and political economy in politics and political economy of the Arab world. He is also a senior associate member at St. Anthony's College, Oxford. In 2013, his book, Saddam Hussein's Bath Party Inside the Authoritarian Regime, uh, Inside an Authoritarian Regime, published by Cambridge University Press in 2012, won the prestigious British Kuwait prize for the best book on the Middle East. Sassoon completed his PhD at St. Anthony's College as well uh, in Oxford. He has published extensively on Iraq and its economy and on the Middle East. Uh, the Sassoons is his fifth book, which we will be covering today as well. Uh, Joseph, we start these intellectual journeys with a uh, almost a personal question, actually, about uh, your own background, how you have come to uh, enter this field of ours, and what were some of the influences as you, uh, you know, were a rising scholar on your uh, intellectual development, and potentially uh, any sorts of uh, correlated stories about your family traveling from one place to another as you completed your studies and uh, became uh, basically a professor of politics and political economy. So feel free to um, uh, expound and feel free to share any details that uh, you feel is relevant. This is, again, uh, something that uh, uh, a lot of people enjoy hearing about because we don't usually have these conversations about the background of scholars. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Bassam. Really appreciate it. It's wonderful, again, uh, to see you. Um, the real journey, I was uh, born and, and grew up in, in Baghdad, and then in the 1970s, my family fled uh, Iraq because the situation uh, was deteriorating terribly. But I would say that the intellectual journey began really arriving in, in Oxford and particularly St. Anthony's. Uh, my supervisor was uh, the late Roger Owen, a great political economist. Um, and Albert Horani was still there, although he retired. But these two men really had a huge, huge impact on uh, my thinking and in intellectual development. As I said, Albert Horani was just retiring, but insisted that he wanted to read every chapter uh, and, and we would sit on a one-to-one -one in his house for an hour to discuss it. Um, and I think I really learned from the, these two people, but also from others who were in at the time at St. Anthony's, like the economist Robert Marbro, about the importance of how you put together um, information and how to wade through archives. And really kind of credit to Roger Owen for directing me. He knew before even I arrived in Oxford that my main interest was in Iraq. Um, and I wanted to do something in Iraq, on Iraq, but of course, uh, because it's historical, uh, we needed to stick to a period where there are documents and there are material uh, about the country. 
So um, this culminated after three years in, in my thesis, which came out later on as a book about the economic policy in Iraq, 1932-1950. Um, and it was really the first time that I spent hours, months, even years, you could say, in going through, wading through the British archives, uh, the British documents. There were in Oxford and in other places, um, diaries and, and notes by um, Iraqis and British, particularly diplomats. And this was really my first attempt at learning how do you wade through this ocean of material to, to find a, a, a story. And I think from there, really, and there are a lot of similar stops in this uh, journey. And I, one of the things that I, after a couple of months, I went to Roger and I said, I don't know where the beginning or the end. There's 20 years, 25 years of documents, um, thousands upon thousands. So, and he gave me a one line advice, which I never forgot let the story develop and he said don't worry the more you accumulate something will come up and it really guided me and twice later on in my uh, intellectual life this came upon when i started working on the book of saddam hussein there were really millions of documents um plus audio tapes of the, the Revolutionary Council, Majlis Qiyadat al Thawra. And after four or five months, someone asked me, well, what is the book about? I said, I have no idea. I'm just reading. It was, it's like swimming in an ocean without any destination because you really don't know what the material. Um, only later on, it develops about, okay, now I see how the structure of the Ba'ath Party was, was put together, how it functioned, how it went to wars, how it arrested um, its enemies, how it run its economic policy, et cetera, et cetera. And the then, the, 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 when I finished that book, I really thought, okay, what do I do um, I would love to see whether the system in Iraq, because I kept seeing in the archives references to Syria, and obviously it's the same Ba'ath Party. And I kept thinking, is it the same system of the intelligence services, of the structure of the party, the cells of the party? Um, but of course, there are unfortunately no archives. I. For the first time, I went and just made the book kind really reading about 150 memoirs from uh, uh, different uh, uh, countries, you know, Arab republics. And then the final stop is the book that just came out recently in, in the U.S. about the Sassoons. You really am an economic historian, political economist. I was never interested in the history of that family. But again, the one thing that turned it around is finding so many archives that have been untapped. And when we show uh, uh, the audience the slides, I will explain why. But that's kind of a summary of the journey. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, can you uh, possibly share with me uh, and with us uh, a little bit about the uh, connection with uh, Roger Owen, uh, given uh, that so many of us, uh, of course, uh, grew up reading him and uh, in, in so many ways, you know, um, being um, uh, sort of in his orbit. Uh, and I personally actually uh, did a very similar uh, interview with him uh, here at George Mason University. And we uh, explored also his own intellectual journey. And he showed us all these pictures. And then, of course, he published his memoir with us, with the Arab Studies Institutes that we in publishing. Um, 
so can you tell us a little bit about about your connection with uh, Roger Owen and who else was around you at the time uh, working with him? Because these these names, I am sure uh, a lot of people will be familiar with. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, Roger Owen was the, the prototype of the English um, uh, professor who um, people saw as aloof, as far away. I actually, it's really interesting. I never felt that um, he was a cold personality. And a lot of people, you know, because he came across that way. I, I, I actually found him incredibly supportive um, all the way at every point. Um, and, and, you know, I left the academic world and then came back to it. And guess who was the first and most ardent supporter? Um, Roger Owen. The other person who actually became a friend later on, uh, but I uh, was my the exa- one of the two examiners of my uh, thesis uh, was Peter Sluglet, who, of course, also uh, uh, worked on, on Iraq. And he really was truly a wonderful uh, guide and, and also a friend. Um, I think one of the things that I was always envious of, uh, of Roger's capability is you know, to think out of the box, to come up with ideas that, you know, like 10 people are sitting around the room discussing the subject and we're all going around the same thing and suddenly Roger would throw something, wow. <laughs> and you realize, you know, there are different levels of, of thinking and capability, mental capabilities. Um, that's uh, that's really wonderful. I. Um... Uh, hope that uh, one day I'll share with you uh, some of this uh, footage because we still haven't produced uh, the final version, which is a personal version recorded at his house, at his office and around the streets uh, around Harvard and around his house. Uh, but I will we will get to that. Um, uh, Joseph, uh, can you uh, share with us uh basically what you consider to be your first uh, book, which you already addressed and tell us a little bit more about it uh, in terms of um, why you decided to, to uh, write uh, that first volume and uh, how, what kind of influences went into the analytical content in that, uh, in that volume. Yeah, I mean, the idea behind it was really how does a quasi-independent country run its economic policy? Quasi, because as we know, Iraq became independent in 1932, admitted to the League of Nations, but uh, obviously until 1958 under the heavy influence of, of the British. And in a way, the British ambassador in Baghdad was probably... Uh, he and, and, and the prime ministers were kind, you know, at the same level. You, you could not really make any big decision. And what comes across in, in that policy is that really there are different periods. The 30s where the British are dominant, but by the end of the 30s, the rise of the influence of Italy and Germany, not only in Iraq, but in general in different parts of the Arab uh, world. And then, of course, World War II, we changed everything. Um, you know, and then the, the change after World War II, where uh, the U.S. is beginning to really take interest. And, and, and you see the American-British economic competition comes in in real force in Iraq post World War II. The Americans realize that Iraq is a very wealthy country. It has huge potential. Um, and you see in the documents how they were going to the Iraqi officials, which to a certain extent were getting a little bit more power uh, compared to the 30s but still under uh, heavy British influence. And the Americans were telling them, you know, we could sell you this or that cheaper and better. And, you know, uh, uh, the British are having their own difficulties. 
in a way, we are the new superpowers. But that takes time. And then, you know, suddenly the, the notion of Iraq becoming really wealthy because towards the 1940s, uh, oil is produced in a commercial way. And uh, I, I think to this day, it was one of the most innovative aspects creating a board of development in Iraq with the idea that half the money is not spent right away, but is devoted to infrastructures and uh, for the long term. Um, and fortunately, that didn't work. Um, and the result of it, if you see it not only in Iraq, but in most other countries in the region, is no one, no regime and no government has this um, power or capability to wait for projects of 10 years, 15 years, because they need to show their population immediate results given the way that they are governing. But definitely that was a possibility that it could have succeeded in, and, but unfortunately there were a lot of other issues in Iraq at the same time that led to the uh, uh, revolution in 1958. And after, make sure we're on, and after that first volume, uh, how uh, did you move to the to the next publication and what, what motivated that and when, when did it happen? Well, <laughs> um, I took, a step away, I mean, by the time I finished, and you will know it, um, I was totally broke um, and I had no money and the salary, and I had to support my parents who left Iraq with, with really nothing um, and my family. And uh, I left the academic world for almost two decades and I went to the private sector. Um, and, you know, both Roger Owen and Peter Slaglet were very angry with, with me, uh, particularly Slaglet um, felt that I betrayed the cause. Um, and at, at some point when I started thinking of coming back again, uh, Roger said, leave it to me. And within three months, I got invited um, to a, a, a conference uh, in in London on Iraq as it happens. And of course, things began to uh, uh, change because the uh, 2003 invasion of Iraq um, put together a lot of interest and, and focused the interest of the media, of, of universities in this topic. Um, and I was very interested because I really felt devastated um, by what was taking place in, in Iraq uh, after 2003. Um, and being personally a refugee felt really strong emotional ties to all those people getting displaced um, internally and externally. Um, and I was giving a talk in Oxford at, on, on a, at, at a conference and the idea came up, why not do a book on, on, on the refugees? And I began to travel in, in the Middle East, but also in Europe, uh, meeting some of these refugees, hearing their stories. It's really actually the only book I have done, which is really based on a um, huge amount of interviews with families, with uh, people who were displaced, some, as I said, were living in, in other uh, Arab countries. And, and you really begin to understand um, what, when there is a displacement, and of course you are the expert on Syria and you know exactly what's happening, what takes place when uh, uh, so many people are pushed away uh, whether internally or externally, and what the country loses on all level, educational, commerce, economic, scientific. Um, it's not easy to replace, and it takes really long, long time. And 
Of course, everyone knows that the longer refugees are outside their countries, the less likely that they will go back. And that's exactly really uh, what happened, sadly, uh, uh, to Iraq. And then the next one is really by, again, pure opportunity. As I was giving a talk uh, uh, at Mesa, uh, someone said, oh, you know, um, the Iraqi documents that the U.S. took out from Iraq are being allowed uh, uh, to the public and to academics. Um, and I really went there not knowing, as I was mentioning in the beginning, what I will find. I read interesting stuff, but again, I couldn't see how it all... And then I remembered Roger Owen's advice, you know, take the swim in the ocean and let let the story develop. And sure enough, after six, eight months of intensive work on these archives, I realized um, what it tells us is really how the regime structured its power, how it it functioned on all levels politically economically uh from a defense point of view from a security point of view um i i was very pleased with with the book but you at the same time really sad about how uh, uh you know one man and one small group of people took the country to so many disastrous uh, uh, decisions, such as the invasion of Kuwait, which was totally unnecessary. And, you know, the war with Iran. I mean, just part of the problem I began to realize and ask the question, and that's really related to the next one about anatomy of authoritarianism. Is the decision making similar to these places? is the fact that Saddam comes and says, I have a brilliant idea, let's invade Kuwait or let's go to war against Iran. Um, you, you know, in one of the documents, uh, someone stood up from the party and said to Saddam, you know, Iran is not a small country. It's, it's a huge country. It says it's an empire, was an empire. And Saddam got very angry with him because how could you raise doubt about this? And uh, was trying to tell him that, you know, it's impossible to, to, to occupy a country of this size. And even if you occupy part of it, it doesn't mean that the regime will collapse because the people will rally around the leadership, even if they disagree with it. Uh, of course, that person uh, 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 disappeared. But um, th that brought me really to the next one about the anatomy and try to compare how Arab republics. But as I mentioned before, I don't have the memoir, so I ended up, uh, I don't have the archives, so I ended up using a tremendous amount of archives from different so i would read memoirs of people in economics security politics um but also literature to understand uh, uh the life of of the people who were living under these authoritarian regimes uh, let me ask you uh, just a question based on uh my own work on uh, the syrian bath party uh, and of course, uh, I see the the uh, second uh, or the anatomy uh, book uh, as as enveloping the first uh, or the one prior, which has to do with the Bath Party. And and you call it Saddam Hussein's Bath Party, which a lot of people also call the Syrian Bath Party, Assad half as Assad's Bath Party, as you know, with Patrick Seal's book, it was um, mm -hmm. it was mostly uh, Assad titled, it was titled Assad, the struggle for the Middle East, because yeah. it was Syria's struggle for the Middle, you know, it, it was it was the, the, the other way around compared to his earlier book, which is the struggle for Syria. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, association, of course, with these uh, 
uh, these two individuals. Can, can you tell us a little bit about when you were doing the work, how you saw the difference? I know you touched on it a little bit, but is there is there something that uh, uh, those of us who are, uh, uh, you know, looking at both countries uh, and not necessarily scholars studying them, but when they see uh, these similarities, are they are they all similar or there are some significant differences uh, that, that we might point out? No, they are definitely different. I mean, in the sense that um, both of them are brutal leaders, and, and but both of them, um, you know, anyone who tells you you can run a country without being very, very smart, I mean, you know, all the stuff that they used to say about Gaddafi, I never accepted it because I used to tell them, irrelevant of what you think of him, the fact that he's controlling a country for 40 years, it's not a simple matter. Um, Saddam was a very charismatic leader. I mean, that really kind, in in a way, I in the book on Saddam, I compared him a lot uh, to Stalin because he was enamored by that personality um, and, and tried to understand how Stalin functioned. I think the, the way they created, whether Assad or Saddam, this, you know, you're close, but you're really never close. You are close, but you're not enough able to say really what you think um, the consequences of a decision. And one of the things that happened in, 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 in these uh, archives in Iraq, which we really do not have any historical parallel, you know, Saddam taped um, for uh, uh, purposes of taking notes, not for, you know, very publicly in the middle of the, the, the room where the cabinet or the inner cabinet, Majlis Qiyadat al-Thawra sat down a big tape and he really would use it uh for the you know like he would write to his secretary and says what did uh the minister of agriculture say three months ago but what you really learn from these audios is the power of the person i mean you know um i began to understand when he's in a good mood or in a bad mood just from the way the meeting starts and it was really all about him you know, there is an agenda, but he really can go on and on for half an hour telling a story and there is no agenda. Um, and the functioning of these states become really problematic. And um, I, I think there are a lot of similarity in this, the decision making, the follow up. And, and of course, you know that better than anyone else with your book describing it. This pyramid also of power, uh, you know, people stop making uh, uh, decisions because if it's good, you really don't want to take the limelight away from the president. And if it's bad, you're going to be punished. So the best thing is um, not to take any initiative. And there is a wonderful document written by Saddam himself to all his ministers, he says, you never say anything. You always write muwafa, uh, agree, agree. <laughs> is there any time that you're going to say no, and here is an idea? And I thought it's <laughs> fascinating that the he hasn't figured out why they're all writing agree. Yeah, it's a, it's a conundrum why people <laughs> agree with Saddam Hussein. Um, well, um, that's that's really uh, that's really um, uh, very uh, insightful. And uh, let me also say that when I was uh, actually a student where you uh, are uh, teaching and directing the center, when I was a student at the center, uh, I wrote a, um, uh, a paper comparing the Ba'ath Party in Iraq to the Ba'ath Party in Syria. And I think there was a book called Bath versus Bath by uh, the French scholar. Yes. Uh, uh, my memory is part of my memory is completely gone. So I I I, I know this person who like we, we actually uh, hung out a few times. I forget his name. He also wrote uh, 
Syria between Cold War or Cold Peace or something like this in the 1980s. Um, and it was really interesting to see uh, <clears throat> the difference in approach and also in rise of, of both uh, Saddam and uh, and Hafez Assad, and uh, later to learn that because of a feud between them, Hafez Assad denied his country, his own country, a lot of income from uh, allowing the oil pipelines to go through Syria. I, it was all fascinating. Of, of course, that's besides the institutional differences. So uh, it's it's always been interesting to to look at these uh, two cases. Is there anything? Is there anything that uh, we can say about? the uh, external relations of these two particular two countries uh the brutality the uh the delusionism the uh, uh sort of way they uh, carried uh, out their rule is, is it uh, and at what point was it somewhat associated with external threats which they always of course uh, exaggerated but what can we say about the uh, context within which uh, these uh, two Ba'ath parties developed that might affect the way they see uh, uh, a need to go further in, in preventing any sort of uh, dissent. Um, and it's odd to ask this question given that the CIA had some hand in, in, in supporting uh, Saddam and his uncle in the 60s to, uh, because they disliked the communists. But uh, is there anything to say about the context so that we are uh, looking at the broader picture? Uh, and, and how much can we say? Yeah, I mean, it, it's really interesting because one of the things that really horrified me is how much even of the so-called military intelligence, which is not supposed to be taking care of the internal security, but focus on enemies, um, there are not really a lot of information. I, I um, interviewed a, a, a one general at the time and asked about the invasion of Kuwait, and he says once the decision was made and the chief of staff began to prepare the, all the plans to invade. Um, they, the, the intelligence services did not have a real proper uh, maps of, of Kuwait. They sent them the first map was a tourist map of, of Kuwait that you can buy it in any shop. And, and that really tells you everything. I mean, where is the intelligence service is really preoccupied with internal enemies. As time goes by, you're absolutely correct. There are a lot. And of course, the minute the war is launched against Iran, there are different cells of uh, uh, that are Iranian cells. And of course, as we get into the invasion of Kuwait and the sanction, the enemies abroad are definitely uh, are conspiring against uh, these countries. But at the same time, really, I would say 90% of the emphasis of the regime is on internal enemies rather than external enemies. Yeah, that's that's definitely uh, that's definitely been a critique that although there were external pressures, whether it's uh, from uh, the U.S., but at a time when the Syrian regime was connected with uh, the Soviet Union, or from Israel, of course, uh, including the '60s, definitely in the '60s and, and the '70s, that these these uh, pressures existed and they're real. Uh, but they were always exaggerated in order to justify various policies of internal repression. But this, but this theme does continue until, in the case of Syria, of course, because the Iraqi regime, uh, for all intents and purposes, ended in 2003. And I would argue, to be honest, right, before that, because Saddam Hussein in 1998 isn't Saddam Hussein in 1988. Uh, in terms of the capabilities and so on. But uh, th this theme does continue un until the uprisings were, of course, it was Assad's son. Um, and uh, in the uprising itself, uh, it addressing the external uh, threats and interventions and so on. So it's it's an ongoing theme. That's why I ask about it. And um, before we move to the uh, last uh, and more least, most recent book, The Sassoons, uh, which is going to be uh, much lighter than this conversation. Um, 
let me ask this one uh, last question about uh, Roger Owen's uh, book, Presidential Monarchies, uh, which was very interesting because uh, he, he likened uh, regimes in the region to, to monarchies, but with a president. Uh, how do you see the uh, uh, similarities and differences between anatomy of authoritarianism in the Arab republics uh, and, and that book of Roger Owen's? Yeah, I mean, um, I think the difference is presidential. The Roger Owen's book is really kind of a, a macro view. I tried to do it from the inside, a micro view of how these regimes function. Um, I and and that's why I wanted to see how these people, whether the heads of security in Egypt versus the ones in Sudan versus the one in Syria, how they write about it later on. Um, so the differences are uh, 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 fundamental, but at the same time, the overall picture, as we all know, is really the same. I mean, the way they they run it was a fiefdom. Um, there was just recently an article in the Financial Times last week about Assad's wife and, and you know, the controlling the economy, the three, four people of the family uh, uh, controlling the economy, according at least to this article, I think it definitely became a fiefdom. And uh, uh, Saddam, you know, and, and Assad, which is Roger's point, they were all talking, and to a way, in a way, Mubarak, about their sons inheriting uh, them. And, and I don't think, I mean, in the case of Assad, it took place. Uh, definitely, uh, Qusay Hussein was uh, uh, being prepared by Saddam uh, to take over, but much later than he thought, you know, maybe by now if he was still around and alive. Uh, and, and Mubarak, definitely. So that issue of taking over from your father, who is a president, and it is a presidential system, it is absolutely correct statement. Thank you, uh, Joseph. Uh, let me move to the uh, last uh, uh, book and most recent book of yours, uh, which is uh, titled The Sassoons, and it uh, uh, came out uh, relatively recently. Um, and I understand that we have some slides and uh, quite a bit to discuss. So, uh, let us know, um, or please tell us, uh, what is it uh, about this book that is different from the uh, previous ones, and uh, what is it about this book that you feel um, connects with the, at the same time with that trajectory of intellectual production? I understand it's a, also a personal uh, story, so that's uh, uh, which has a lot of ups and downs, uh, and as you as you narrate in the book. If you can share with us uh, a synopsis of the book for those who are not as familiar with it. Sure, thank you. Um, it's definitely nothing connected to all the other four books about politics and economic history and political economy. Um, I actually was in Oxford uh, finalizing the book on anatomy of authoritarianism when I got contacted by someone who said that he's a Sassoon and let's chat, and we ended up chatting. Um, and I thought if I'm in Oxford, I might as well start going to the archives to look at it because I was intrigued uh, by what he told me. I really was not interested in the history of the family, and I write about that in, in the preface to the book. Um, but as I will show you, um, I did found a huge number of archives of documents of the family. Um, Shall I go me, to them as you narrate? Yeah, just go to the next one. So the founder of, of the dynasty um, is David Sassoon. Um, and let me just talk about it because this is really important for people who are interested in the Arab world and the Middle East in general. The next one, please. Um, so this is David Sassoon. Um, his father, Sheikh Sassoon, 
And this is very important. There was a Jewish presence in Iraq or what was called Babylon or Mesopotamia for 2,500 years. And I think it's really critical to understand that they were part and parcel of these places. Um, you know, they were part and parcel of the Ottoman Empire uh, throughout uh, the centuries. So David's father was what is called Sarraf Bashi, the equivalent of a tax collector, but in today's modern jargon is each province has its own governor and minister of finance called the Sarraf Bashi the equivalent of a minister of finance. Um, and he was the Sarraf Bashi for uh, almost two decades. But um, governors changed in provinces. Some governors were very good. Others were corrupt and, and not good. Nothing has changed uh, there or anywhere in the world. Um, and a bad governor comes in who starts uh, embezzling money from different merchant families and well-off uh, families. Actually, the Sassoons were not in the merchant business, as I just mentioned. And um, what, what happens next is he arrests David Sassoon, the son, to put pressure on the father to pay a ransom. And the father realized that this is not going to end up uh, well. And so he and the son um, and the sons found David's uh, fa small family escaped um, to Iran and from Iran they, uh, the father died and David Sassoon decided on a major uh, uh, journey to begin a new life in Bombay because he heard that India is open to all sects and religions irrelevant of, of um, you know, their identity or, or, or where they came from. And, you know, was first, so the siblings of David Sassoon stayed behind in Iraq. I am the descendant of one of those siblings who stayed, as I said, until the 1970s. The irony of the whole thing that we ended up escaping also to Iran but just 150 years later after uh, David Sassoon escaped. Um, two important things from a Middle East point of view. One, the connection to Baghdad never was lost. Um, the connection to the Arab world was never lost. And, you know, I know that uh, the, the professor Ella Shoha talks about Arab Jews. That's how they define themselves, okay? This is not a new term, but that's the way how they presented themselves. First Arab, then the, the religion. And this is really important. When David Sassoon succeeded and in, in towards uh, the 1850s and started... Um, it, to be uh, uh, honored by the British uh, in, in India. Two things. One, he never took off his formal Arab dress because that's how he saw himself. Two, he always insisted on answering in Arabic. Um, and he made sure that all his children learn Arabic. The, the second, uh, if you go to the next one, that's really what made me write it. This is Arabic. This is a Baghdadi dialect written in Hebrew. The only difference there are, this is a Hebrew. So in a way to decode it, you need to know the uh, Arabic, you need to know Baghdadi dialect, and you need to know the Hebrew letters. And fortunately, you need also to decode the writing. Thousands of these documents describing everything about the family and, and how, and this is really, again, uh, kept reading until I figured there is an incredible story to be told. Next, so, please. So this, is, so this is basically a transliteration from a Baghdadi dialect in Hebrew. 100%. Wow. It's all Baghdadi. And there are words creeping into it in from Persian and Ottoman, but that's, again, understandable because Baghdad was part of the Ottoman Empire and Persia was, you know, the neighbor. And of course there was 
uh, uh, very strong uh, uh, Persian and, and Turkish influences. So very qu very quickly, very quickly, if if the uh, Hamza, which is the apostrophe, and the Ayn, the letter, the uh, letter, or uh, uh, yeah, the letter Ayn in Arabic, you know, we we try to use an inverted apostrophe or something of the sort in English. So when you go to Hebrew, I, I guess these are easier because the, yes, they are because similar. Yes, the same. There is an ayin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's much easier, yes. yes. The, the, the complications in these documents get really worse as time goes on because they start introducing English words and, and put them in that language. So, for example, governor, general, they don't translate it neither to Arabic or to any I other see. language. They just uh, uh, write it down. Okay, uh, let's go to the next slide. This shows you the map of the tremendous expansion. So David Sassoon, um, from his first marriage, had two boys, two girls. His wife died after the birth of their fourth child. He remarried and from his second wife had 10 children. So in total, there were 14 children and he spread them throughout Asia and the Middle East and created really network. And it's really fascinating because two things have not changed for anything. You need networks and you need information and, and he figured it out uh, uh, very clearly. And in the book, I described all their trades and, and, and um, in the different commodities and the ups and downs um, and, and, you know, how these children who, by the way, all spoke Arabic because you needed the Arabic uh, uh, for the first two generations until more and more of the Sassoons began to move to England and wanted to be anglicized. Next, please. So this is the main characters, uh, uh, David Sassoon, Abdullah, his first son. By the way, they all anglicized their names as they arrived to England. So Abdullah changed his name, Albert, and became Sir Albert because he was knighted. Elias, actually, the second son, Elias, uh, stayed in, in, in the um, Orient, uh, in, in, in uh, India and China. And one of the most fascinating aspects, Bassam, in this book is the discovery that the Sassoons had the only woman who was a CEO of a global trading firm. She ran an incredible business from 1895 to 1901. And, and there is a whole chapter uh, uh, dedicated to her. And, and it was really the biggest joy of researching finding a woman at the time who not only insisted to be part and parcel of the business, uh, uh, but run it and run it in an incredibly efficient way. Um, the last picture is someone more modern because the family split into two competing businesses, and I'm not going to go into this now, uh, but Victor was kind of the 20th century person who really created an, um, another empire, but this time not in India, but the epicenter was in Shanghai in the 1920s and 30s. Next, please. This is, if you go today to Mumbai and you ta tell any driver, take me to the Sassoon Library, take me to Sassoon Hospital, take me to the Sassoon Docks, these docks were built uh, after the Suez Canal was open and trade routes became very important, uh, 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 Abdullah acquired and um, purchased those. And uh, as I said, to this day, it is called the Sassoon Docks. Next, please. Um, this is Farha. Again, she changed her name to Flora upon arrival uh, with her husband, Suleiman. She was a Sassoon. He was a Sassoon. Um, which is kind, again, typical at the time of uh, uh, family members uh, uh, getting married. One of the sad part of this is that the men in the family were not happy with the success and, and uh, being glorified all around the world, so they kept conspiring against her.
Next, please. This shows you once uh, they owned incredible uh, uh, houses in, in India, um, and really they used the Arab hospitality um, to uh, you know connect to officials, to the people, whether in India, whether in China, whether in Japan, whether in Indonesia, in all those places. But then once they all started moving to England, estates and big houses and not working hard and so the work ethics disappear and the spending increase and we all know what the result of that is the demise <laughs> next please this gives you a typical you know the best picture showing you now because they are part of the aristocracy well you have to play their games right so it's hunting shooting horse riding rather than working 14 hours for six days. And um, Victor that I mentioned built the first skyscraper in uh, Shanghai. If you go to Shanghai today on the Bund, which is the main street, you will see this beautiful building, which is still the one on the right at night. And although it's a five-star hotel, if you look outside, uh, there is a plaque called the Sassoon Building. And actually the hotel has uh, put together a small museum of the Sassoon Museum there. Nice. Yani, yani, as we say, uh, Joseph, yani, mish <laughs> no, you, guys no. were, you guys were everywhere. We're the guys everywhere. It's really amazing. Thank wow. you. Wow. No, thank you. This is uh, this is a wonderful journey, and I thank you for sharing it with us. Um, wow, I uh, uh, you know I uh, had uh, you know known uh, about about uh, the family, but writing this book must have been must have been a really interesting uh, journey in itself for you. Yes, I learned a lot about India, about China, about globalization, about colonialism in these uh, places, about the role of British imperialism uh, and, and its impact on the population. Um, but also learned a lot more, you know, because the, it's interesting when in the fourth, third, fourth generation, there were other talented Sassoons. Uh, but not in business. So in World War I, and every British student knows that, but they don't teach him in America. The first pacifist um, that went out against World War I was a famous poet, uh, Siegfried Sassoon. He was injured as an officer, highly decorated, and began to write poetry um, you know, against the war or against wars in general. And which was a very brave thing to do in the atmosphere that prevailed in Britain. Um, there is a Rachel Sassoon um, who was the editor of the first national newspaper in 1917, long before women in Britain had the ability and the right to vote. Wow. Okay. Uh, let me let me move to to uh, conclude. Uh, although it'll be it'll be great to talk a, a bit more about uh, a number of these topics that we addressed. But let me uh, first, before I conclude, let me say that it was a wonderful experience that we uh, both had, along with our colleagues and associates at both Georgetown University, the Arab Studies Institute, and George Mason having put together the uh, Iraq 2023, the 20th anniversary of the U.S. invasion of Iraq. It was a uh, very uh, uh, powerful uh, conference day, like an entire day with a couple of panels and the showing of About Baghdad and uh, a series of podcasts. One of them is this one, which, uh, which uh, arose as a result of that occasion, but also as a result of me wanting to do this with you. By the way, you mentioned two people that I did the same exact uh, podcast with, including Ella Shohat, who actually started the series. Um, uh -huh. And then, yeah, and then, uh, uh, of course, Roger Owen. Um, 
So I'm very grateful to this. I want to take this opportunity to share that uh, by the end of April, that we are uh, publishing a website, uh, a portal that uh, includes all the resources uh, from these uh, events, as well as uh, a a resource hub for everything that has to do with the invasion of Iraq and uh, extensively uh, with time, Iraq itself. And that portal is uh, theinvasionofiraq.com, which is a very straightforward URL. So please feel free to visit uh, at any point. Um, and now let me ask you, uh, Joseph, if there is uh, anything that you want to conclude with, but I will in inject in this commentary uh, a question which is what's next you've you've published five books you're now um, directing uh, the premier center uh, for arab studies in the united states and i do understand that you are uh, ready to uh, move on from from that position in a few months uh, can you just tell us briefly what's next for you and uh, any closing words you'd like to share uh, because we really um, are uh, honored to have had this conversation and I am uh, happy to, to continue speaking with you, of course, uh, maybe in the future. Um, I, I doubt that you're going to settle down, so I'm sure that we will have an opportunity to uh, to talk about your next production. I hope so. I hope so. I, I think that um, really, unlike other books, um, one of the wonderful things is the ability to go around so many places in America and Europe, uh, but mostly in America and virtual, of course, a lot of events, um, which is actually, I really am enjoying it. Um, you know, meeting people, talking to people, getting so many different questions, um, hearing wonderful stories. Um, I gave a talk in New York and two people showed up um, uh, and showed me their IDs and they both called Joseph Sassoon, one from Halab and one from Alexandria. And I thought, what an amazing world we live in. Um, I really, I have ideas in my head, but I haven't really developed a plan yet. Um, probably in the next half year to a year, something will pop up, yes. Absolutely. Uh, I'm, I look forward to it. And uh, I want to end by uh, thanking you for uh, being with us and uh, for sharing all this information and these insights uh, and these analyses uh, and your personal story with uh, your family. So I really appreciate this, uh, Joseph, and I hope to uh, continue seeing you uh, in uh, various uh, circles, which, which I will actually next week uh i will be um coming by to to see everyone and uh congratulate everyone on the work that everyone did for the uh for the recent iraq conference shukran joseph and uh, all power to you and i uh, look forward to seeing you salam 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 joseph